I think this is exciting. I have to tell you how my brain works. Things kind of evolve. I'm still um, making notes and having thoughts, and I'm really excited to share with you today. I, this is, um, I do love uh, kind of sharing a window to my world, and, and Jonathan knows that, you know, my thoughts really don't come together. I do lots of thinking. Some of you are similar, um, but I'm very excited to, uh, to be with you today and to share. Our theme is Proclaim Wholeness. And I just posted an image on our Mission Road Facebook wall, and I'll talk to you a little bit about it later, but it is a picture of the moon. If I had my act together, see, Jonathan, I would have sent you this one, but I'm gonna get a little picture of it right now. So this is a picture of the moon. I don't think you can see it because of the light, but whatever, it's a, it says, it's a meme. It says, the moon is a reminder that no matter what phase I'm in, I'm still whole. So we'll kind of digest that and come back to it later. Our scripture is from Mark, the gospel of Mark. And it's the part that reveals Jesus as a healer. It reveals him. We, you know, we can assume he's been a healer in his life for a little while, but this is kind of the big um first witnessing that we have documented. Yeah, we're still on the moon. I know that we uh we're tired of of COVID and all things about it, but I want to share with you a little bit about my world of healers. I'm a blessed and privileged witness to so many good things that are going on. I think whenever there is tragedy, and this has been a very long drawn out pandemic um, tragedy, but I have good news today and I'm excited to share that with you. I wanna share with you about um, some of the uplifting messages that the healthcare workers send to each other and particularly one person in particular who is um, blowing my mind with her uh, healing abilities. So I'll read to you from Mark, before I get organized. This is Mark chapter, chapter one. Jesus has been baptized. I'm not reading yet. I'm just talking still. He's been baptized by John the Baptist in the very first um, verses. And at this point, when our scripture comes about, uh, John has been thrown in prison, so Jesus' action, as I see it, is accelerating because Jesus witnessed John as a baptizer and a type of a healer and an effector of many, many people. He was probably noticed by um, the authors of the gospels because of he was so prolific and well known. You know, there's probably many, many unknown uh, diligent healers at that time. And we never really get to hear about them except through sort of fictitious people's ideas of what that might look like. I love that. I love guessing what was between the lines of, of what we actually know. And, you know, eventually John the Baptist is beheaded by Herod. And, you know, from what I've heard, his, his crimes are essentially, you know, making Herod look bad and, and getting more famous. So people don't like that. Imagine in today's day, uh, if you make someone look bad and get more famous by doing it, you'd get your head cut off. So, so Jesus becomes uh, more visible because of what John the Baptist had been doing. So Jesus called the fishes of men by the Sea of Galilee. Next section, he drove out a demon. Now we come to Mark, chapter 1, verse 29. So I will read that. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told Jesus about her. So he went up to her, and he took her hand, and he helped her up. The fever left her and she began to wait on them. That's so cute. That I'm sure they said, sit down, you just got healed. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon possessed. And I gotta tell you, you know, I've been in healthcare for 30 years and we all have sort of a 
a graphic cartoon image of what demon possessed look like, but I have a looks like, but I have a very real idea of what that was to them. Um, lots of people that have, you know, mental health issues when they are uh, really severe, for sure. Um, in my mind, I'm guessing that would be someone they would call demon possessed. So uh, I know a bit about that and I speak the language and I love uh, helping and affecting and um, helping to heal uh, people like that. The whole town gathered at the door and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. So demon possessed, various diseases, assuming physical. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, this is verse 35, kind of a new paragraph. Early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So they traveled through Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Who is a healer? I already kind of mentioned there were other people at the time of Jesus, um, and there is some documentation of the other healers in that time. Jesus appeared to stand out, like I said, because of the prolific nature of his healings. People actually lined up instead of a healer going to someone's home, they were flocking to him. And also these healings are described to be spiritual healings also, as well as physical Jonathan, go to the next slide. And this is, this is a, a, an image that I will keep forever. This picture I took in April, early April. This is from my work on the COVID ICU. This is a nurse, a charge nurse and a doctor. I took this picture I was kind of scared to take it because every place in the hospital, you, you really, you know, can't photograph certain things. But I took this picture because they had been standing there for over 10 minutes and they had not moved. So they're talking quietly and they're watching the monitor, not really the patient. They're watching the monitor. And I know these people and I know no force of nature could take these heroes from their post. They were watching and waiting for a change because they knew that any change would require the emergency action of these three people. At that time, they were only allowed to have a small number of people in a room because of the contagiousness of the virus. And you know, later that changed, but they were the three that were gonna um, that we're going to go in there and it's it's a it's a powerful image for me personally because i was learning about covid at this time later i'll tell you about one of them the nurse in the yellow hat um, named tori and how she changed from a healer of patients to a healer of her peers in the scripture it says everyone is looking for you and i ponder several things about jesus the healer in, in my large therapy department where I work, we have different people of varied specialties. So for example, if you have vertigo, then you, we would assign you to Jay. If you have uh, a newborn baby, then Jen Krause would be the one to come and help. Mm -hmm. If you have a cardiac bypass surgery or a valve replacement, if you're on the burn unit, um, and so on and so on. I like the doors. Healers to heal because of their compassion. And Jesus was, was not medically trained. I mean, maybe he was to some degree, and maybe he was a, a very intuitive um, 
absorber of, of that type of thing. He was primarily a spiritual healer, but because our mind is completely connected to our body, physical healings for sure occurred and, and we do read about them. So because humans evolve, I believe healers evolve. Jesus' intense compassion from ages 12 to 30 moved him to act and to embark on the journey of baptism and gathering fishermen to move and act on it, to bravely affect people was because of his oneness with God. Um, go to the next slide, Jonathan. This is a picture of one of my other heroes. This is Scott. So I'll let you look at Scott and I'm gonna read. Um, this is a Henry, Henry um, Nowen, I don't know how to say his name, Nowen. Henry Nowen book um, related to our scripture today. A little bit of a reprise. In the morning, long before dawn, he got up and left the house and went off to a lonely place and prayed there. In the middle of sentences loaded with action, healing suffering people, responding to impatient disciples, traveling from town to town, preaching from synagogue to synagogue, we find these quiet words in the morning long before dawn, long before dawn, he got up and left the house and went off to a lonely place and prayed there. In the center of breathless activities, we hear restful breathing. Surrounded by hours of moving, we find a moment of quiet stillness. In the heart of involvement, there are words of withdrawal. In the midst of action, there is contemplation. Jesus knew by that point in his evolution that he had to go become whole himself in order to have that effect on other people. After much togetherness, there is solitude. So, and you know, these efforts require so much energy. These people in the images that I'm showing you require uh, required so much energy and not all of them understand going off in solitude and not all of them have the same level of um, awareness clearly um, as Jesus did to take that to take that make that choice in this picture that you're looking at Scott is reading to Bob He's reading a letter from Bob's grandchildren. And I actually have a video of this um, that I can't show you, but uh, it is extremely powerful. There's some pictures you can see in the lower left-hand corner. There's some little drawings from his grandkids. Bob passed away the day after this picture was taken and the day after I made the video. And I was moved to work with Scott to, and we played country music for Bob we had to find um, a laptop or a iPad and we sent him off to uh, Hank Williams Jr. I think, or Hank Williams Sr. And I sent that video to Bob's family and Brian and I were fortunate to attend Bob's visitation. Go ahead and go to the next slide, um, Jonathan. These are signs placed inside the door of the rooms in the COVID ICU. Uh, I took these pictures, the next pictures that I'm showing you, I took them over the last week because the good news is our numbers are getting lower and we wanna keep that going so much. We had five COVID units and now we're down to two. And this is still one of them because this is where um, the most critically ill patients uh, are kept. This is the view that you would see if you were a patient and if you were um, fighting for your life. Go ahead and go to the next one. It's kind of the same, just a little different view. So if you're in your bed, you look out and you could see the people walking around 
but right in your face are words of encouragement. And these are on each door in a little different way. Sometimes they would put um, images on the ceiling because in real life, if you're laying, if you're more recumbent, you, you stare at ceiling tiles all day. So they were putting um, families' letters and families' um, pictures up on the ceiling for people. It takes a lot of work, you guys, to, to do all this extra stuff. They really didn't have time to do it, but they knew that this element of, of healing and providing hope was super important. They, they made these signs, I'm just thinking of this right now, they made these signs in a time when there was, they had to have done it uh, at home, you know, all of this work. They didn't do it when they were at work. There's no way, there's no way that's possible. Do the next slide. I took a, uh, the, this is um, the next couple of pictures as I, uh, I took these pictures because I, saw these images when this is in the bathroom and I would go in there use the bathroom and the nurses had these sticky notes and there were several of them and they would change and someone would make a new one and they were little notes to each other to lift each other up I've been so moved by the connective energy that they had for each other and these little notes started in early on in April and May, just to kind of give you the timeline. It'll sort of be important later, but the nurses that worked inside these walls needed something more than what they were getting. And that says the sole purpose of human existence is to kindle a light in the darkness of mere being. Go to the next one, Let's see what it is, something kind of similar. Hold your head high. You can do hard things. I believe in you. These were all the time. There would be new little notes. It was like they, they go in the bathroom. That's their solitude. That's the only place they could go to have quiet contemplation for two minutes. And that's a mini recharge. I just love it. Show me the next slide. This is... Um, Mark this, Jonathan, we'll come back to it because I think I'm gonna read it when I close. Go ahead and go to the next one. Other little notes, that Dalai Lama one, it's hard to read, I, have, I rewrote it, let me find it. It says, on the one on the left that you can't really read, some of you know this um, sort of poem. He said there were only two days in the year that nothing can be done. One is called yesterday and the other is called tomorrow. So today is the right day to love, believe, do, and mostly live. And the one on the right, you can read better. Courage is resistance to fear, mastery of fear, not absence of fear. So these are messages that the patients can't see these are messages for the healer. Since March, you know, there's been a lot of suffering. And I think I, what I want everyone to understand as, as people that, you know, don't have all the pieces, this time has taken such a toll on the nursing staff. People don't know that the families communicate with the nurses, not the doctor. The doctor um, in our large COVID setting and the other ones that I know of, um, the nurse is the one who receives calls. The nurse is the one who makes calls to the family when um, things change. And when the worst happens, the call comes from the nurse. So imagine they don't go much very often a shift without a death and that stress is is too much you know it, it is a it is a warlike experience for nurses that didn't sign up for that i heard that phrase so many times so we have lost a lot to um other other areas and other professions unfortunately but as i said i had an experience with tori and i follow her on facebook she i had an experience with her in a room one day where she provided such incredible encouragement for this young man. He was about 33 and I helped her help him 
simply roll from his back to his stomach and get up and use the toilet. And that whole event took 45 minutes because he was terrified and couldn't breathe. And her, I, I felt like a witness. I was helping, but I was more of a witness. And when we came out of the room, I just took her by the shoulders and I said, you're blowing my mind. I can't believe how patient you were with him. So many, I feel like would have given up and just let him have peace. But because you led him through that process, he is going to get better because of it. And she was kind of, you know, appreciative, but um, taken aback. She sees it as that is, you know, who she is and what needs to happen. The very next day, I read, um, unrelated to anything I had said, she began a journey of starting a foundation for the nurses she works with and starting a Facebook group um, to have support for the supporters and healing for the healers. So this was in December. Her foundation is called Hand in Hand and her website is called Nurses Helping Nurses. And this is just a girl that I've worked with for all these you know, months and years before that. So what she's done, this is since mid-December, she started a foundation. This week, there is an acute traumatic incident processing support group on Zoom. They do self-care. They do one of those uh, things where you smash objects to like vent off steam. So they went to a place together and they broke things, which I know some people can't relate to that, but if I see them in daily life, I completely get why they would want to go in a room and break things, it's, it's to release. Similarly, they did a letter burning where they would write a letter of venting. And then as a letting go effort, they had a burning uh, at somebody's house. You know, She's giving them that opportunity to go and become whole so that they can come back and help us. It, it, it's amazing. I, I don't know of any other efforts in the country that are like this, and this is incredibly close to me. They did a group mural where they put paint all over their bodies with some kind of suit on, and they did a group mural, and it's somewhere. I, I've seen it. They did pet therapy. She set up um, some massages at work, like chair massages. So when there, there is just people who see a need and they are moved by compassion to a level far more evolved than most of us see. Although we all have like the capacity to have healing abilities, not all of us, I realize, is a true healer. I'm gonna read one more little passage from Henry. The more I read this nearly silent sentence, locked between loud words of action, the more I have a sense the secret of Jesus' ministry is hidden in that lonely place where he went to pray early in the morning, long before dawn. In the lonely place, Jesus finds the courage to follow God's will and not his own, to speak God's words and not his own, to do God's work and not his own, he reminds us constantly, I can do nothing by myself. My aim is to do not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. In the lonely place where Jesus enters into intimacy with the Father, that his ministry is born. Jonathan, if you wanna go back to that one red framed slide, there you had it. This hangs in the middle of the medical COVID ICU for all to, uh, to pass by. And I think we're privileged to be able to share this prayer connecting with those people who are there right now. Give to my heart, O Lord, 
compassion and understanding, give to my hands, skill and tenderness, give to my ears, the ability to listen, give to my lips, words of comfort, give to me, Lord, strength for this selfless service and enable me to give hope to those I am called to serve. Amen.